thinking, you know, when you follow the Lord the best you know how, and you do what the Lord says, he accomplishes much. While you're turning to Galatians 4, where we will continue in our study of Galatians, the Lord impressed me. I should mention to you that about the trip I just made to Nevada, the man and his wife who sponsored the meetings did all the legwork and got everything together for a very successful two nights there, which brought people in from many long distances to those meetings. You remember last year, <clears throat> many of you prayed for meetings in California at a place called Vallejo. These, this man and his wife came over to hear me in Vallejo, and their marriage was completely smashed when they came. I didn't know anything about it. But through deliverance that this woman received, an insight she received into the Jezebel spirit and some deliverance from that spirit while she was there in the Vallejo meeting. I think I prayed for her. I believe I was the one who prayed for her. She got some massive deliverance. And their marriage was healed and put back together. And isn't it strange? They're the ones now who's, who got together. And she called me a while back and said she and her husband praying and they felt like the Lord wanted me to come to Nevada. Would I come? And so we worked out the dates a few months ago to go there. And so it's, it's amazing how the devil is whipping, being whipped around the stump by the Lord. I mean, these people that he has destroyed and smashed their lives, and then when they come in contact with deliverance, although they don't, they're not deeply experienced in it or anything like this, they had since been reading the books, they had since been ministering to each other and to others who came to them, and the meeting was a tremendous success. And this is the way it's going, people. It's a grassroots movement. It isn't a Hollywood star system at all. There are no stars involved in this thing. It's strictly God's people being stirred by the Holy Spirit to do what God says in his word and to go about to just find out how to destroy the works of the devil and then do it. And this has been the root of every great revival. And the revivals have failed in the past because deliverance has not been pursued after a sovereign move of God caused the Holy Spirit to come down and move in sovereign power. We've, I could stand up here and cite you cases, revival after revival after revival. And when they came to a halt, it was because deliverance was not pursued. It always broke out but was soon sidetracked because people got involved in other things. They found a better way, and the better way left the revival dragon, and the next thing you know, it was blotted out. I'm convinced that this time God is determined to keep deliverance in the forefront of the thing, to knock the enemy off the tracks, and to bring a measure of evangelism, healing, and supernatural wonders such as has never been witnessed. And he's going to do this not through some supercharged preachers popping up like popcorn and say, look at me, am I not great? But he's going to do this through men and women, ordinary Christians who've gotten steamed up at the devil and said, I'm sick and tired of being kicked around. I'm sick and tired of being defeated. And I'm going to study and I'm going to pray and I'm going to seek the God's face till I learn how to break out of this mess that I'm in. And it's happening all over the country and it shall continue to happen, God willing, until we've broken the devil's neck. I'm looking for him to have a severe and tremendous and traumatic defeat. Now the demons are expecting the same thing. They are bracing for it and they're fighting against it savagely. And that's why if you don't stay in the mainstream, you'll get swept aside because the demons are going to pick off anybody who strays. Stay in the mainstream. Don't get off into the byways. I'm telling you, there's nothing out there that will help you. Stay in the mainstream. Dig deep in the wells of deliverance. We haven't begun to plumb the depths. We've only dipped a cup full or so. Did you know there's a regular artesian well down there? I'm praying that we can dig deep enough to hit that thing and let her loose. And we're going to see supernatural wonders on a scale that has never been matched before. If you read War on the Saints, and I do, do uh, put this before you, read War on the Saints. 
I have never seen anybody swept away from deliverance who had steeped themselves in war on the saints. Those who give it a casual go by, they didn't get what's in there. One of the things that Evan Roberts warns about is that when the sovereign work of God begins, the revival is doomed unless the people follow through with deliverance. He ought to know. He was the forefront, he was the focus of a revival that started and went on, off and on for 50 years that thing came. It would die down and then it would explode again and start all over again. It was just one of those things that couldn't hardly be put out. And yet, it didn't do everything God wanted to do because it stopped short of defeating the enemy. People have got to learn to stay in the deliverance trail if they're going to hold this revival on the tracks where God wants it to be. And I believe God's preparing people for just that thing. It isn't as glamorous, it isn't as nice, it isn't as exciting as some of these other things, but I'll tell you what, it's very needful. And Evan Roberts says in there that God has to prepare people or they cannot be trusted to be carrying power. It will corrupt them. Power corrupts unless you've been prepared for it. Power and success are heady wines and they'll make you spin out if you don't are not balanced by enough experience and hard knocks so that you know that you're not really anything. This is the work of God where you can stand in awe with the people and watch it, what God's doing through your life. When you get there, there's no limits to what God can do. Well, let's go back to Galatians chapter 4. Again, we're getting through it very slowly. There's so much here. He talks about his the disadvantage under which he preached there. And he says in the 20th verse, I desire to be present with you now. He said, I wish I could be there and talk to you face to face instead of just having to write a letter. For I stand in doubt of you. He said, tell me, ye that desire to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? These people want to go back to a legalistic check, check system. He said, tell me, you that are so eager to be under the law, haven't you really heard what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondmaid or a slave, the other by a free woman. He that was of the bondswoman was born after the flesh. Abraham and Sarah came up with a neat little scheme to help God out of a bind. You remember the story that God had gotten himself in a corner. He painted himself in a corner. Did you ever get to painting and paint yourself into the corner and couldn't get out? Well, to Abraham and Sarah, it looked as if God had done just that. He had made a promise that Abraham's seed would be as numerous as the stars of the sky and as the sands of the seashore. And here Sarah has already gone through the menopause. She's gone through the change of life, can no longer have children, and she doesn't even have a child. There's no descendant. God made a promise and he wasn't able to keep it. Oh, this is a crisis. And Sarah came up with a neat little plan. I don't know who could have given her that idea. <laughs> she came up with a neat little scheme that Abraham would go ahead and have a son by her slave girl. And then when that child was born, Sarah would take this child and rear it as her own. And that way, they could get God out of the corner. God wouldn't be embarrassed, because it is embarrassing if God gets to making promises he can't keep, isn't it? Well, Abraham went along with the idea. So don't blame it all on Sarah. I mean, it takes two to tango, and, and Abraham was just as gullible as, as Sarah. He believed it too. He saw, well, this is a good way out to solve the dreadful problem. And they were going to help God out. And they made a mess. And every time people have been trying to help God out since, they still make messes like that. As a matter of fact, we're still being affected by the mess they made. You see, the descendants of Abraham through the free woman are the Jews. The descendants of the slave woman through Ishmael are the Arabs. They're kinfolks, and they fight every time they meet. That's what all this war is about over there. 
They can't stand each other. They have fought for centuries. Every time they come close to each other, they jump on each other. And they fight, just fight, fight, fight. They're still at it. Because Abraham and Sarah tried to help God out. So the next time you help God out, just remember, you might set in motion something as big a mess as they did. And just don't do it. Wait and see if God can't get himself out of it. It's just barely possible he has a way to get out of that situation that you and I don't know about. Now, all of us, I think, if we've walked with the Lord very long, we've, we've been guilty of trying to get God fixed. Because we see what a deadly embarrassment this is going to be. And, oh, we can't let God get caught hanging out on the limb there. You know, we've got to rescue him. Well, he doesn't need rescuing. Let's just watch in awe and wonder as he works these wonderful things out in his own inimitable fashion. Well, so this is where it all came from. The one who was of the bondswoman was born after the flesh. In other words, this was strictly a product of man's wisdom given a little inspiration from the sidelines. And since God didn't give it to him, guess where it came from? The enemy, of course. All right. You say, you mean they were deceived? Yes, they were. They were godly people, but they swallowed the devil's hook. Now, they found out about it later. But there were still problems because of their move in that direction. He that was of the free woman was by promise. You remember the story how after they tried to fix it and they tried to get God out of this terrible mess he was in, then the angel came and told Abraham, now you're going to have to wait longer because you didn't believe God. So Ishmael, well, they had to wait another uh, eight years. And then the angels came and said to Abraham, now it's time, after eight years, Ishmael's eight years old, he'll be nine by the time the miracle child is born. And he's running around the tent, and oh boy, not only did Sarah not raise that child, she couldn't stand him. She didn't like Hagar either. Those two women walked around looking at each other. Hagar, being the slave woman, had to be careful. But she had the heir. The wife didn't have nothing. And those two women just walked, and there was, there was terrible tension in the tent. Now, what happened then, the angel came and announced, now you're going to have a son. It's, it's time now. God's decided to go ahead with the promises. He gave you the promise. You tried to set it aside, but it won't work. God rejected man's plans like he always does. Comes through with the original plan he had all the time. And he said, now your wife Sarah is going to conceive and bear a son. Well, like any good wife, Sarah was behind the tent flap listening to see what those men were talking about. <laughs> and when she heard that, she just cackled out. She laughed. That was the silliest thing she'd ever heard in her life. Here she was, an old woman, past the change of life. She could not have a child. And these angels were having the audacity to say, she's going to have a child. Impossible. And she just laughed right out. And the angel said, and by the way, you'll call his name Laughter. That mean, and that's what Isaac means, laughter. Can you imagine? God has a sense of humor, you know. All those years Isaac was being reared. Come here, Laughter. <laughs> You know, it wasn't like God was whipping her for it. He just reminded her. <laughs> Honey, you laughed at the promise of God. Now, that doesn't mean that God didn't like her and didn't love her. In spite of that, he just has a sense of humor. Because when he uh, calls the Hall of Fame over here in Hebrews, he talks about Sarah as being one of the examples of the faith. She's one of the few women mentioned in the, in the Hall of Fame of faith. He didn't mention a thing about her faith staggering at that particular time. He remembered the good things she did, and she did a lot of good. Praise God. That's great, you know, that God remembers the good. All right, so this is how it all came about. He said these things are an allegory. An allegory is a, a story that tell, is kind of tells a story with pictures. For example, said these are the two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth unto bondage, which is Hagar. He said one came from the slave woman, the legalistic system, and this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answers to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is mother of us all. 
For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she that hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. We have been born again by promise, by faith. We are a supernatural product. Isaac was supernatural. His birth, his conception was supernatural. It went against all the laws of nature. Abraham and Sarah were past childbearing. They shouldn't have been able to bear children. And that she had a very healthy child. And that was against nature. And it was against all the laws that anybody knew about for you and me to be born again. It was an expression of God's marvelous grace that comes forth. And we are children of promise because of the grace of God. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Now when they grew up, when, they, when this Isaac was born, here you have this, by the time Isaac is born, Ishmael is nine years old. Now Hagar has always had the advantage on Sarah because she produced the son and the wife had produced nothing for Abraham. Now, the legitimate wife has a legitimate heir, and the, the crossfire really begins between these women and the jealousy, and Ishmael begins to pick at that baby. He picks up mama's attitude, which is not very good, and is jealous and angry, and Hagar is jealous for her son. He's the eldest. The eldest son should have the birthright. But she was a slave woman, and here's the freeborn woman's child is going to take precedence. And so Ishmael begins to pick at that little one. This causes a lot of friction and irritation to the point that Sarah finally tells Abraham, get that woman and this brat, her brat out of here. I don't want them around here. I can't stand them any longer. Now just get them out of here. Now Abraham, with heaviness of heart, had to do that. He put Hagar out with her son because there was no way to keep it going. You see, the, the, the old fleshly um, construction will always end up fighting and battling against that which comes from the Spirit. There's no way the two can coexist. When the spiritual thing is birthed, when the spiritual move of God comes, you can always expect that which is of the flesh to turn in, in hatred and persecution and jealousy against that which God is doing. So any true move of God, you're going to find hatred and persecution coming at it from the things that are not based on faith and on the grace of God. Grace and faith are completely antithetical to works and the legalistic system. Now what happened, of course, you remember that Hagar and her son were put out and she was weeping and God gave her a promise because it wasn't her fault what had happened. Abraham and Sarah had done this. She was a slave woman and he said don't weep about it because I'll make of your son a great nation as well. And he did. And you see between Ishmael and Isaac, the descendants of those uh, two men there are multiplied hundreds of thousands of people who call Abraham father. They go all the way back. The Muslim nations in Arabia and so forth all hearkened to Abraham as their father. They just came through Ishmael instead of Isaac. You see? So uh, the persecution came and he said it's the same, same thing now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondswoman and her, and her son. You've got to get rid of that which was built by the flesh. For the bondswoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman, the son of the bondswoman. In other words, the two, there are two children there, but one is an heir and one will not inherit because he doesn't have the right antecedents. It was not conceived by God. This is why I keep pointing out to you that motivation is all important in what you do. A lot of people, you can, you, can, you can have a preacher, two preachers preach the same message. One God will bless, one God will not bless. And it's a matter of motivation. 
One's motivation is to do what God said. He's coming from his heart and God's heart. The other man is preaching to make a name for himself, to show that I am great, I can do exposition, I can preach, I can move people, I can motivate people. And a lot of people in pulpits today are nothing but super salesmen. They're not Holy Spirit filled. They're Spirit filled. They certainly are. You can tell the Spirit just crackles off of them. But it's soulish, and it is coming from soulish enthusiasm, and they fire up people's minds, wills, and emotions, and they even get their bodies to move in. But friend, if it doesn't come from the Holy Spirit, it is pure garbage and will accomplish nothing in the long run. It's good for nothing but burning. I've been in services where people got worked up into a lather, a religious lather. Did you ever go to one of those? You sit and you watch in amazement. You hear a preacher yell out, and you say, I'll tell you, people are going to go to hell. And they'll say, amen, amen, hallelujah. Well, you know, I don't, uh, I know people are going to go to hell, but I don't exactly rejoice about it. Because I know that Jesus died. To, you know, they'll say amen or hallelujah to anything. And they get going and they holler louder and the people holler louder. And the next thing you know, somebody's just jumping up and down having a frantic fit. And I think, well, what? I must have missed something. That lady's about to have a conniption fit over there. She's so happy and what? The preacher was preaching nothing but garbage. Now, what got her so charged? Well, you see, if you're tuned into soulish nonsense, then you'll get stirred up. You say, I don't think that's possible. You don't? Haven't you ever seen a football game? There's nothing spiritual there. I mean, nothing in the Holy Spirit there. But haven't you seen people get excited, jump, scream, holler? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, letting them be enthusiastic. But you wouldn't say, my, aren't they religious? <laughs> Didn't God get glory? No, the people were having a good time. They were, they were really letting off steam and everything, whatever you want to call it. And I'm not saying that's wicked in itself. But when you move it into a church situation and you use the same thing, you have a pep rally with the pom-pom girls coming with tambourines instead of pom-poms to get everybody jazzed up. <laughs> I'm a little old for this. But you might hear my joints creak, you know. But you get the idea. If you move it in church and, and try to have it be something glorifying Jesus, you're a little bit hard-pressed to make your point. Especially if you've got a few old stick in the mud sitting around analyzing it from the point of the Bible and saying, you know, I don't know whether Paul would have done that or not. And of course you say we're living in modern day. That's a little more modern than I'd like to get. We've gotten so modern, we've lost all our power. I'd like to slide back in the slot and get a little antique if that's what it takes. Go back to basics. The basic truths that stirred the hearts of people and moved them with the power of God. I have no objection to people shouting, waving their hands, jumping benches, anything they want to do if they feel good in the Lord. But I despise this contrived, worked up foam and lather. A lot of people come here, you know, and they say, well, you know, Hagrid is just so dead. <laughs> well, dead to what? There's some things we're supposed to die to. But I've seen Hagwish break loose and become hilarious at times. But it wasn't because I thought, now we've got to have a stir up here. We've been rolling along, kind of ta 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 ta, -ta for several services. And first thing you know, the people are going to say, well, it's getting dull. So we're just going to have a wing ding this morning. We're going to have a religious wing ding. <laughs> And I'm going to get up there and I'm going to pull the strings and I'm going to work on their emotions and I'm going to preach three points and read a poem and tell a sad story about a little dog got run over by a truck 
and have them all in tears and then have them all hit their feet praising God because we, you don't have to have, it doesn't matter what you use for a reason. You follow the same manipulation thing. And people, that's so cheap. God doesn't need that kind of thing. Uh, you'll find here, we believe, in, we believe in speaking in tongues. We believe in messages in tongues, interpretation. We believe in prophecies. But we don't wait and say, I believe someone has something from the Lord. We'll wait. No, we do believe God has something from for us. This is the main thing he has right here. Everything else is incidental. This is the cake. Other things may be the icing. But if you get all icing and no cake, pretty soon you're going to get spiritual sugar diabetes. I like cake with icing myself. But at any rate... I believe that the Holy Spirit's well able to break in and give a prophecy, a message in tongues, and brother, we'll throw the brakes on and hold her tight and wait when God gives a signal or something like that. If God breaks through and says everybody go love everybody, that's what we do. But we follow an order of service. We're very dignified here. We're still Baptists. Sort of. Well, I mean, the Baptists don't think we are. And they wish we'd drop the title. I think it's an embarrassment to them when they come by. The people that we bought this church from wanted to chisel their name off the front of it. <laughs> and we wouldn't let them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we have quiet devotional type services. We're Baptist. I mean, we sing a while, we testify a while. We, some of the testimonies are a little weird, a little strange, maybe to some Baptists, but they're not strange to us. We find them n normal. Then I preach a little while, and then, then we have kicking, screaming, hollering, and fighting, you know, just the ordinary run-of-the-mill type church service. And we believe that God can break in at any place and do his thing. But I just want God to do it. I don't want it to be because I want to do it. You see, so many people have been in a service where the Holy Spirit came in mighty power and fell on the service. Boom. And it was of the Spirit. It was the Spirit of God that did it. It was a sovereign work. God thought, my people are dry. My people are hungry. My people are thirsty. And they've been crying out, oh, Lord, just bless us. And bless their hearts. They need a little bit, a little extra oomph today. And so he, he lets us have it. Bang. And you find people laughing and crying and having just such a good time and just worshiping the Lord. Uh, maybe it happened after you sang a while and got to testifying. And then uh, all kinds of strange things began to happen. We've had services where the preacher didn't even preach. My, what a blessing, huh? See, keep coming. You may get over one of those one of these days. But it was always because the Lord broke in. Now, what happens, you see, when, when God moves like that and blesses a group of his people, then here's how it happens that people get off track. They get away, they go away from that service, they're thrilled, they're excited, they're just, <clears throat> isn't it great to be a Christian? And that's right, because God gave it to it to be a time of refreshing and uplifting and encouragement. But the era comes when people go away and they think, now, our next service... We're going to have another one of those. That was so good. Now we want one just like that. Forgetting that God never duplicates. He has infinite variety. Some things are similar, but he never actually duplicates anything. He doesn't have to. The devil is the duplicator. Everything he does is exactly the same. Boom, 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 boom. Once you trip to what he's doing, you, you, got, you got him pegged. Because he duplicates everything. He doesn't have any variety. But when you come to God, there's infinite variety in his, what he gives to his people and experiences and blessings. And what people do, good people, godly people, they'll think, boy, now let's see, what did we do? We sang such and such a song, and then we switched and we did testimonies, and then we did this, and then boom! Now if we do that again, if we follow the formula, it'll happen again. So with great faith, they move into an excitement waiting. 
And the people that have been there, they think, oh, we're going to have another one of those. And they get all excited and expectant, you know. <laughs> They're all waiting, you know. And they get to the place where, where, they, where the Holy Spirit's supposed to, boom, you know. And God isn't interested in it. It wasn't his idea. And the devil said, religious spirits, get down there and duplicate that service for those fools. They're ready for it. They'll accept anything. So the next thing you know, some sister over here lets out a war whoop. Woohoo! I see it all. And it spreads like the plague. And people start jumping and laughing. Ha 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 ha! Yes, isn't it great? Of course, you have fuel stick in the mud sitting around thinking, something's wrong. It's isn't quite the same. But they feel kind of guilty because they're not with it, you know. And you have churches trying to endlessly duplicate the sovereign working of God. It never works. It won't work the second time even. What you do, you walk with Jesus and you go right on just a simple, ordinary walk. And then when God comes in and moves with special function and power, you just say, oh, thank you, Lord. What a pleasant surprise. And you let him have free sway. You back off and let him have it. Now, if you watch this in churches, this is why a lot of artificial 40 roll is going on in some groups. And among sincere, zealous, God-loving people. And yet, this is why nothing is really happening in their lives. They end up disappointed somehow. Well, you know, we had this wonderful service, and I don't know why it is I'm still so depressed when I got through with it. Well, I need to run back and have another one of those services to get me up again. And they start feeding on religious services, not on the Word of God and not on the pure Word of God. That's the only thing that's going to help us. Well, the bondswoman's son cannot be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondswoman, but of free. Did you know we weren't born of slaves, but we were born of the free? We were born to be free, not bond. I was a slave until I knew Jesus, weren't you? I was born again out of the slave pits of sin into his marvelous freedom. I still had the grave clothes on. You know, we talked about Lazarus coming out of the tomb. It's a beautiful picture. When he came out of the tomb, he was bound hand and foot like a mummy. He didn't walk out, I don't think. I think he hopped out like a bunny rabbit. He like a sack race. He was all tied up. And when Jesus said, come forth, here he came, just hopping up. Or some people said, well, maybe he just floated up off the ground and came out. I don't know. Anyway, he came out. And then Jesus said to his friends, loose him and let him go. Jesus could have spoken and all the grave clothes would have fell off. All the wrappings they'd put on him would have fallen away. He could have done that. He could have just said, be gone. And they would have dropped to the ground. But he didn't. He chose to use the friends of Lazarus who had been so grieved because he was dead. You see the picture of it? Isn't it a beautiful thing? Come death unto life. He used those friends who had been so grieved because Lazarus was dead to loose him from those bondages that marked him as a dead man. And I pointed out to you before that when, you, when they took the grave clothes off, they didn't walk up and say, here, get that off for goodness sakes. That's not fitting. You're alive. You're not dead anymore. Take, that, take those stupid bandages off. I'd be ashamed. It's a disgrace to walk around looking like a corpse. Well, now that's the way they do it in the churches, isn't it? Somebody gets born again, they come from death right out of the tomb. They got grave clothes on. All their old ways are hanging around on them. And I'm telling you, their friends gather around. They don't even have to wait for them to say, loose him and let him go. They get, get up working on them. Get that thing off my land. You look terrible. <laughs> You're not dressing right. You're not talking right. You're not doing right. It's a wonder anybody makes it. With the rough handling you get. How do you think that they really loosed Lazarus? Mary and Martha, his sisters, and the other friends who loved him and had been weeping because he was dead, 
They went in, oh, ever so tenderly, and they unwound those bandages. Here, let me help you. Oh, let me help you with that. And they were so thrilled to be able to help. Listen, those old grave clothes need to be unwound by the friends of Jesus. That's the job he's given us to do, and it's a, it's a job of love and tender compassion. And we must be careful not to be rough and ugly, but rather tender and loving as we unwind those old grave clothes to get the people free. Well, verse 1 of chapter 5, he said, because we are children of the free woman, because we're not in bondage, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. See, the Galatians had been set free. They had been loosed in the liberty wherewith Christ had made them free. And they had turned around and under the persuasion of witchcraft. Who has bewitched you, cast a spell over you, Paul said, that to draw you back from the truth of the grace of God and the faith walk into a walk of bondage to rules and regulations. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Be not entangled again. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Behold, behold I, Paul, say to you, if you be circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. He said, if you go in and have circumcision performed on you as a mark of the Abrahamic covenant, thinking you're going to be uh, made a child of God by that, he said, then you're saying Jesus is of no effect. If you're taking Jewish marks to try to get you right with God, then you're saying Christ didn't do what was done for you. And he said, I testify to every man that's circumcised, he's a debtor to do the whole law. He said, if you're going to go that route, then you've got to go the whole route. Forget about grace, forget about faith, go the whole way, and you're a debtor to the law. Christ has become of no effect to you. You've, you've pushed him aside and said, I don't need him. I found a set of rules and regulations. And then he said, whosoever of you is justified by law, you are fallen from grace. What's he saying? He said, if you are justified by the law, if you think that you're made righteous just as if you'd never sinned, that's what justified means, to be made just as if you'd never sinned. He said, if you think that you can be made just as if you had never sinned by the works of the law, he said, you have fallen away from grace. You fall away from the grace principle altogether. The grace principle says Jesus did it all. You accept what he did, and his righteousness is charged to your account. And the law which you couldn't keep, he, uh, you couldn't keep, he kept perfectly. Now, he said, but for we through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. He said, we did not come into this thing thinking we were going to get righteous by works of the law. He said, we are waiting for a hope of righteousness by faith, for in Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Faith and love and grace are all intermingled into this thing. When you read Paul's letters, every one of them starts off with grace and peace. Doesn't it? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. All of his letters start this way. He's loosing a spirit of grace. He's loosing a spirit of peace. Because he knows how prevalent the legalistic era is. How easily it's like weeds. You don't have to plant it. It just comes up. Did you ever plant a garden? And then you go out there and take somebody out to see your garden. You say, well, why did you plant all these weeds? You say, I didn't plant those. Here's where I, what I planted, these little things right here. The weeds just came up. You didn't have to plant those. Listen, legalism and Phariseeism, you don't have to, you don't have to cultivate that stuff. It just comes up. You've got to keep it weeded out of the garden. So the good things will grow like grace, faith, and love. That's what we need. He said, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? He said, you're in disobedience. To obey is better than sacrifice, you know. And he said, you were running so well. Who did hinder you so that you did not obey the truth? He said, this persuasion comes not of him that calls you. 
This legalism, this man-made righteousness, this man-made holiness did not come from God, the one who called you. If it didn't come from God, who do you suppose it came from? The master of religion, Satan himself. He designed it, especially so you would get caught. The bait is to bait it and say you will be righteous. And if you really want to catch flock fish, put a little hook on there that says you shall be as gods. If you really want to hook the fish, tell them that someday they'll reach perfection in these bodies. You'll be like God. Walk through the earth. <laughs> Mark miracles. Everybody will stand in awe and say, oh, did you see that super Christian go through? There's nothing like that in Scripture. The people who were the greatest in God's army were the least conscious of what they were doing. They were so wrapped up in Jesus, they forgot all about what they were doing. They were busy giving glory to Jesus because they knew that's where it came from. The people who concentrate on how great they are are not. You can mark it down. Don't get caught in that. He said a little leaven or yeast. Leaven's a whole lump. Did you know when you fix a big bunch of bread dough, if you want to put yeast in it, you don't have to put a half a pound in there. Just put a little leaflet full of powder in there. And you mix it up and you just let it stand. And you don't even have to stand there and say, yeast, go through, yeast, hurry up, hurry up, grow, 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 grow. You don't have to do a thing, but just put it in there. Bring it in close contact with the dough. And then you back off, and what happens? That dough begins to rise. That means the yeast is growing. It's shooting all through that dough until the whole lump is leavened, full of yeast. And yeast in Scripture is used almost invariably, I think. I can't think of an instance where it's not used as an, uh, a picture of evil. Why is that? I wonder why would yeast be a good example? You say, oh, well, we shouldn't eat... Uh, Yeast bread? No, that hadn't got anything to do with it. God picked it out because, first of all, the yeast only takes a tiny little pinch to do a whole bunch of dough. Evil's like that. Doesn't take much to mess it up, does it? All right. It does its work so quietly that if you weren't watching, you wouldn't even know it was doing anything. It doesn't make a big bunch of noise. It can be very quiet about doing its work. But it, and, and it does its work extremely thoroughly. It goes through the whole loaf. He said, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whoever he be. Now he's really laid it on the line of the Galatians. He said, I am amazed that you'd turn away. I'm amazed that you'd be hoodwinked. I'm amazed you'd be bewitched and come under the spell. I'm amazed that you'd so soon turn from the teachings you received, from the supernatural miracles you received, and all the other things you had. And these new jack lag teachers came through town, spouting off some new things you'd never heard, and you got hooked, hook, line, and sinker. He said, what is the matter with you? You have to be bewitched to be acting so ignorant. Because if you stop and think, who spent the time with them? Who paid the price to get the gospel to them? Who laid the foundations? Who was the one who got them to Christ? Who was the one who brought them to the Savior? Who was the one who led them into deliverance? Who was the one who taught them how to pray? Who was the one who taught them how to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and led them into all these beautiful things from the Lord? They forgot all that and they accepted the word of somebody that had done nothing for them except come through and say, we've got a new revelation. Be careful. That's how it's done. And it hasn't changed a bit. It's the same old progression. When, when a, pe a body of people is to be subverted, this is exactly what happens. Somebody who has paid no price Mark this down. You will not find the scars of the nails in their hands. They have suffered nothing. They will suffer nothing. You will end up in a, in a ministry that will bring condemnation instead of freedom. These new revelations that, I, that I've run across and checked out 
invariably bring people into deep condemnation. I was in a place recently and a lady came to me who had been here for a season and she came to me and she said, now I think I believe what I'm hearing. She said, but you know, when you got 10 minutes into your message, my little girl leaned over me and said, Mama, let's move back to Hagwish. She said, I can understand what Pastor Worley's saying. And she said, I believe this, but it seems to me that our pastor is moving away from deliverance. And I was in a spot. If you have any ethics, you don't. You, you're very careful what you say when you're in somebody else's house. I looked at her and I called her by name and I said, well, tell me this. I said, were you confused when you were at Hagwish, the months you spent with us? She said, oh, mercy, no. That's where I got my eyes open. That's where I got delivered. That's where I got all the freedom and everything. But said, now I'm constantly beset by confusion. And I said, you weren't when you were with us. She said, no, not at all. I said, how strange. I said, maybe you better come back home. She said, I've been thinking about it. Listen, people. You better go back and find out where the confusion started. Some people have not checked their roots to find out where the root causes of these things are. When you start hitting confusion, something is causing it. And confusion is not the Lord. Go back and find out what kind of teaching you're getting into. Did you know that if a cow that's giving good fresh milk, if she gets in a patch of bitter weeds and eats a bunch of bitter weeds, her milk will be bitter? When you start giving bitter milk, you better start checking out and see whose patch you're eating in. Hmm? I'm telling you people, these things, these, these false teachings are so clever. One of the first marks of them is confusion and condemnation. Because you don't seem to be able to attain. Somehow you're not as holy as these other people. Or maybe you're just more honest. Because I find a lot of these so-called holy people are making excuses for their sins and condemning you for yours. They're not all that holy either. The pot's calling the kettle black. Why not say that all of us have nothing except the righteousness of Christ and as it becomes manifested in us, all of us will be better. And when God is creating holiness and righteousness in, it, in us, we will reach out in love toward those who are having trouble and say, come on, you can have it too. God doesn't love me and better loves you. And if he's helped me, he's going to help you too. It'll be encouragement, not condemnation. You'll minister. But every one of these strange revelations ministers condemnation. If you don't understand this message, oh my, you better go back and get tapes one through ten. <laughs> what about your hogwash? If I can't teach you a passage out of Galatians and you get something out of Galatians and you get something that when you go back and reread it, it doesn't minister at least something to you. You don't have to have a whole series of tapes or books. If the Holy Spirit is moving, he will minister to you in some way that will help you, that will bless you. It may even spank you. Sometimes he blesses, sometimes he blistered, blisters, sometimes he does a little of both depending on what we need. Most of the time we need a little of both. But God does this with his word. Well, he said, he said, I want you to know, you Galatians, in spite of the fact that you've been acting kind of strange and weird and gotten shaken off your rockers, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you'll be none otherwise minded. I believe this shock will bring you back to your senses and make you reevaluate things and go back to where you came from. But he that troubleth you, that's the teachers that came through with all this garbage, he said, he'll bear his own judgment, whoever he is. He said, God will get his hide for that. And I, brethren, if I preach, yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? 
then the offense of the cross has ceased. You know what they were doing? They were saying, well, you know, really, this is the same thing Paul preaches. He just didn't get around to telling you this while he's here. Paul said, baloney. He said, if I'm preaching circumcision, then why am I persecuted by these people? Why do they hate the ground I walk on? He said, I would they were even cut off which trouble you. Friend, that is very a very serious statement. Paul said, I am so angry in my spirit about the sheep being wounded and, dis and scattered and confused by these wicked teachings. He said, I would that they were even cut off which trouble you. He said, I could just wish they were completely cut off. That's how evil and how wicked it is for those to bring and introduce false teachings that will destroy the peace and the blessing of the believers and the growth and substitute some kind of man-made righteousness for the righteousness of God through Christ. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Now, you say, oh, that's good, then I can do as I please. I can say anything I want to. No. He tempers it. He says, but use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. He said, don't make a fool out of yourself. Don't make a laughing donkey out of yourself just because you have liberty. But use your liberty by love to serve one another. You are at liberty now to love one another and serve each other. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Now some people think you're biting and devouring when you expose things that are wrong. Friend, wait until you are pastor of a church and have had the responsibility put on you to look after the well-being of the spiritual well-being of those people. And when God warns you that something is coming in to hurt the flock, you dare not keep still. You must warn the people. This sloppy agape stuff that's going around, love everybody. I just love everybody. I don't. I mean, there's some things I hate. I hate idolatry. I hate false religion. I don't hate the people involved in it, but I hate what they're doing. And I'm not required to love such things. To love the people? Yes. Many of you came out of dreadful darkness into Jesus' marvelous light. You would have never done it if this church ministered condemnation. If this church ministered hatred and meanness you would have never come out of that you would have shied off and said well I don't want to go to that place but because this church has been blessed of God to minister love now don't understand me saying we're doing it everything perfect I'm sure there's a lot of things God sees that we don't see that should be better but because basically that's the thrust of the church is to minister in love to the best of our ability. The little bit we're doing right has done an awful lot of good. And people have been drawn in by the hundreds, by the thousands over the years to receive. That same love and compassion and concern for the believers is in the books and tapes. I say this because all across the country we're getting letters and feedback from people who come here and people I see in the meetings who come up to me and they come up weeping saying, I was so ministered to when I read the book, when I heard the tape. It blessed me so I felt loved and I was drawn to do something. And I was encouraged to do something. And what God had spoken to you people, the testimony he gave that woman, the testimony he gave that man, what happened to that person encouraged me to believe God could help me too. And I want to thank you for doing what Jesus said to do. It's working, people. Oh, it's not spectacular. It hasn't made the headlines at all. 
but it's well known in the spirit world what's going on. There are some great churches and ministries I've never heard the demons speak against. Never had them speak a word against it. But I've never known them not to down any live wire deliverance ministry anywhere. They have always universally denounced every effective deliverance worker, whether they were in a church or it was a whole church or whether it was just a little group or a man and his wife or whatever. You ask them, what do you think about so-and-so? And they go into cussing fits. Why? Because deliverance is so dangerous. It cuts the roots out from under and it lays a foundation for God to move in mighty power after the prisoners are set free. Then they can receive the gifts. Then they can receive the healings. Then they can receive all these marvelous things. Praise the Lord. I'm glad to be involved just a little bit in God's program, aren't you? Praise the Lord. Let's stay in the track. Don't let anything pull you out of track. Stay with God. Get into the scriptures. Just live in them. And ask God to feed you from his word. And keep binding and loosing. A lot of people don't think it does any good, but they, they're sadly mistaken. That's another lie the enemy would like to have. If binding and loosing didn't do any good, the demons would encourage everybody to do it. If it just wasted time, if it was a mere religious exercise, then demons everywhere would push religious people to start binding and loosing. And we would never be able to keep up with the request for the prayers, the warfare prayers. Did you know that? There'd be such a demand for them. Because every Tom, Dick, and Harry would be wanting to do them. Because every, but as a matter of fact, the demons fight it savagely. Because it does work. It does do good. It does cause consternation among the enemy. Praise God, we've found a few things that work. I'm persuaded there are many, many more things. But they're not out here in fantasy meta. They're down in the well of deliverance. We've just scraped up enough and there's just a cup full of water. You can dip a cup of cold water out. But I'm telling you, I heard there's an artesian well down there if we can drill deep enough. And when it comes up, the little oasis in the desert is going to become an irrigated field. And whereas we're seeing hundreds of people help now, we're going to see literally thousands and thousands upon thousands blessed as the water comes springing forth to break the bands of wickedness. Don't you believe it? I do. If you're here tonight and you've never asked Jesus in your heart or you're not sure about your relationship with him, wouldn't you like to make sure? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never done this or you're not sure, wouldn't you like to? You could ask him tonight. Lord Jesus, if I've never really asked you to come into my heart before, I'm asking you here and now, come into my heart, save me from all my sins. If you really mean that, he'll come in. If he's already there, he'll tell you why you're confused. Don't go away confused about your relationship to Jesus. It should be sharp and clear. Put the devil on the spot. Challenge him. Say, oh, he says, well, you're not really saved. Say, okay, if I'm not, then Lord, Lord Jesus, you come into my heart right now. You can put a stop to all those little nagging voices of fear inside you. Don't let him. It doesn't hurt to examine a diamond. Every time you examine it, it proves its worth. If you've got real salvation, examination won't hurt. If you've got a fake, you'll be scared to death to have somebody look at it for fear they'll find out it's not real. But if you know it's real, you don't mind examining it. If that's not your problem, but you're driven, harassed, tormented, this is producing compulsive behavior, which is causing you to slow down, stop, or reverse your spiritual growth and progress. This is the work of demons, and you need deliverance. Jesus said, these signs will follow them that believe in my name, so they cast out devils. That's why we do it. We encourage you to come. There are, there are workers here who can help you and will help you. If you come to indicate you have a need. Another sign that follows believers, they shall speak with new tongues. If you've never received this gift, and that's what it is, it's a gift for you, a gift for believers. If you haven't received it, come. Somebody here could share with you and show you how to receive it, even pray for you to have it if you really want it. And God never gave a gift that wasn't worthwhile. Jesus left it here for us as a wonderful gift. And then another sign that follows believers, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall all recover. If you have a need, by all means, come. If you can't get that salvation business straightened in your own mind, come and let somebody here help you. Just come forward and say, I need to talk to somebody about salvation if that's what you need. Let's stand, sing something about that name. As we do, if you have a need, 
by all means, we encourage you to come and let God's people minister to you.